So hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on unacceptable behaviour and grievances. So it's our second webinar in our series of 10 Code Total HR webinars that we're going to be doing. It's lovely to see so many familiar names and some of our Total members joining us today as well. Now I'm sure um, you've all got patience to be getting back to, so we will be making a start now. So firstly then, to introduce myself, my name's Hannah Larkworthy and I'm a HR advisor here within the team at Code. So let's just quickly talk about what we're going to go through in today's session. So the aims of today's session are to help you increase your understanding of employment law and manage grievances in line with legislation. So the objectives of today's session are to dis discuss an overview of employee rights relating to a grievance, to highlight the risks of ignoring a grievance raised by an employee and to explore how Code Total HR provides useful policies and template letters to help you comply with your legal obligations. So the learning outcomes then from today's session are going to be to avoid potentially costly mistakes when implementing the grievance process, to improve your understanding of the ACAS Code of Practice relating to grievance procedures and to understand statutory employment rights relating to the grievance process. So in order then to achieve all these um, aims, objectives and learning outcomes, what we're going to go through in today's session. So the key topics of today's session are going to be what is unacceptable behaviour? And I'm going to provide you with some examples as well. We're also going to talk about how to manage unacceptable behaviour in line with best practice, how unacceptable behaviour links to grievances and what grievances are, as well as how to deal with grievance in line with legislation. And we're also going to touch upon why it's always important to seek advice at all stages of the process and the potential consequences of getting it wrong. So firstly then, let's define unacceptable behaviour. What is unacceptable behaviour? So unacceptable behaviour can be any behaviour that is adverse to workplace morale, adverse to workplace cohesion, offensive, abusive, belittling, threatening. It covers a number of different things. So to help you um, understand in more detail, I'm going to provide you with a few examples. Now, it's important to remember that unacceptable behaviour can be emotional and psychological as well as physical. So there's three top um, calls we get on the Code Total HR helpline about unacceptable behaviour. Now, one of them is going to have to be bullying. So we get a lot of calls on the helpline about bullying. And you'll be surprised about the number of practice managers that call us feeling that they're being bullied by one of their own team members. So in this particular situation, what we do is we talk to the practice manager about whether they've spoken to their practice owner. And if they haven't, we encourage them to speak to their practice owner in the first instance because they are a really good support in this situation. But we also talk to them about whether they would feel comfortable addressing that team member directly. Would they feel comfortable sitting down, having a one to one meeting with that team member to talk about how they're feeling, their concerns, but also talk about how they can address that behaviour going forward so both parties can walk, work together in a happy environment environment. Now another reason we get um, calls on the helpline about unacceptable behaviour is harassment. Now I'm sure you've all heard about the Me Too campaign recently and um, with um, sort of sexual harassment we have received an increase in calls on the helpline. Now one um, practice that we did recently um, help to give you sort of an example is a practice that called us following a complaint from a self-employed associate about harassment from a patient. So I'm sure you appreciate it was a particularly delicate case to deal with. Now it's important to remember that your self-employed team members can claim discrimination. So if you do ever come across this scenario it is important to pick up on the issue and deal with it and appreciate as delicate it is it is really important to do that. And again, sort of harassment covers third parties as well, including your patients as well. So another real common reason, if not, to be honest, the most common reason that we get calls on the helpline about unacceptable behaviour is banter. Now, what is banter? So banter is different to every single person. What one person finds acceptable, another person may not. And the key is, if that person finds it unacceptable, that is unacceptable behaviour and you do need to deal with that. 
So how do you manage unacceptable behaviour? So one of the key things we focus on here at Code is prevention. So prevention rather than cure. Preventing that unacceptable behaviour happening in the first place. So one way you can do that is by having a really thorough and robust training and induction plan. So from day one when a team member starts, set out to them their expectations, your expectations about their behaviour within the practice. What you find acceptable and what you find unacceptable and what you will deal with as well. And by having that in place right from the start they'll know exactly what you expect of them but also to prevent the behavior you sort of as a management team you can be really um, sort of if you feel confident in dealing with the issue you can pick up on those issues much quickly and that will help you manage them so stop them escalating and becoming almost unmanageable more difficult to manage so by picking up on that in the first instance and you can also do that by having almost an open door policy being approachable to your team members so they feel like they can approach you in the first instance and come to you when an issue is small and you can deal with it then it'll be a lot easier. Now another way of um, sort of dealing with um, issues and preventing them almost happening in the first place is having robust policies and procedures in place within your practice and again that comes back to um, setting out your standards of behaviour and your expectations to your team members so they are fully aware of that. But also by having those procedures in place, it gives you a framework to deal with any issues should they occur within the practice. Now this is going to be a common theme now that comes up throughout today's webinar. It's really important to deal with issues promptly. If you deal with them quickly, they will become sort of more manageable. They'll be much easier for you to pick up on while they're small, almost nip them in the bud as such, rather than wait. We do get a lot of calls unfortunately from practices who thought the issue would get better and wish they called us beforehand. So it's really important to deal with them properly because they'll be much more manageable for you. Now there is a couple of ways you can deal with these. So you can deal with them informally. Now that could be sitting down, having a one-to-one -one team meeting, a one-to-one -one chat with that employee to raise your concerns with them. Talk about how they are feeling, why they're behaving in this way, but also address how that's making other people feel and your expectations going forward. But you can also address these matters formally. So if potentially the issue is more serious, you could go straight to potentially a formal or um, investigation and disciplinary in the first instance. Now we do get a lot of calls on the helpline, how do I deal with unacceptable behaviour? Can I sit down and have that one-to-one -one chat with the, the employee or is it more appropriate to go straight to an investigation and disciplinary? It is a really common question so if you ever come up against that example where you're not sure how to deal with it, give us a call, we can talk it through with you, we can talk through your risks and sort of your options in regards to dealing with it. You wouldn't be the first at all to give us a call on that matter. So a grievance then, what we find is unacceptable behaviour quite often leads to a grievance. So for instance, you have unacceptable behaviour displayed by one team member. If that um, continues, particularly if it's prolonged, it's quite likely to lead to a grievance from another team member. So it is really important that if you can deal with that unacceptable behaviour in the first place, to do so. So let's define what is a grievance. So a grievance is a concern, a concern that an employee raises to their employer. Now it's not just a general moan. Now it can be very difficult to define whether their complaint is a moan or whether it is a formal grievance. So again if you're not sure give us a call, we can talk it through with you, we can understand the information in a bit more detail and decide whether it is a formal grievance or whether it is just a general moan. Now one key thing to know is that grievances are quite often um, in writing. So an employee will submit a written letter to their employer to highlight their concerns. Now with grievances it can be very difficult sometimes to deal with them, particularly if that team member is reluctant. So if they have come to you with a concern that they've raised your attention, they may sometimes say they don't actually want you to deal with it. Now as a practice that can be very risky. So you need to almost balance that risk of perhaps not dealing with that situation, particularly if it is a um, very serious situation or it could be in the future, but also not going against um, how they feel, not going against their wishes and balancing those two between you. So if you're not sure about how to do that, give us a call again, we can talk that through with you and we can talk to you about how you can support that team member in encouraging them and almost protecting them and making them feel like they're valued and you want to deal with that grievance, but also protecting your practice at the same time. Now it's also important to remember that your self-employed associates, so your self-employed associates don't have a right to raise a grievance because they are self-employed. However, they do have the right to claim discrimination. So if they do raise a concern to you, we do recommend that you do deal with that concern to protect the practice, but also make them feel valued as well.
Now, if you do come across that situation, it's important not to deal with that grievance. Um, deal with the self-employed concern as a grievance. If you treat it as a grievance, treat it in line with your grievance procedure, you are potentially treating them as a worker and they may go down the route of claiming worker status. But going back to what I originally said, it is important to deal with that grievance um, and that concern that the associate raises in the first instance. So if you ever get a concern from a self-employed team member, give us a call and we can talk that through with you and support you about the best process to deal with that. So as I sort of touched upon earlier in terms of unacceptable behaviour, where possible, again with grievances, if you can, deal with them informally in the first instance. So as soon as you become aware of an issue within a practice, pick up on it with a team member, discuss it with them, understand exactly what's happening and why they're feeling that way. Put actions in place to address the matter as well, but also make sure that you follow up with them after you've put those actions in place. So have one-to-one, -one, regular one-to-one -one meetings with them to check everything's okay, the issue's not escalated further and it's improved. And if you need to, put um, sort of further actions in place. Now, informal action in the first place really helps sort of employee engagement and employee morale. They'll feel really valued. But also from the perspective, it could save you a lot of time. So potentially grievances can take three, four, five months to deal with. Now, that's because grievances can be very difficult for an employee to raise to an employer. So potentially there could be um, they could go to their doctor and they could get signed off with um, stress. So that can elongate the process. That may mean that you have to wait until the team member is feeling better, feeling well enough to either attend a meeting or come back to work before you can deal with that grievance. So it can take quite a lot of time to deal with. So if you can pick up on the issue first place um, informally, that would be really beneficial to both yourself and the team member as well. So a grievance procedure then, it's really important to have a robust grievance procedure within your practice, not only to um, explain to employees how to deal with um, problems should they occur, but also to help you manage them as well. So you've got that robust framework. Now there's a number of things that a grievance procedure should include. So it should include an informal stage. Now usually um, employees are required to raise uh, matters, grievance matters, to their line managers in the first instance. However, sometimes they don't always do that. Sometimes if they're particularly serious, they go sort of skip straight to the um, informal stage, which is absolutely fine. But if possible, encourage them to try and do that in the first place. But a grievance procedure should also include how, how to raise a grievance. So that would normally be in writing and who to raise that grievance to. So is there a nominated person within the practice to um, raise that grievance to? So for instance, your practice manager. But a grievance procedure should also include a number of steps as well. A number of steps about how that grievance will be dealt with. Now, each grievance is different, each grievance is unique. So those steps won't be exact for each team member, but it'll give you sort of a guideline to be able to deal with um, sort of the grievance when they raise it. There should also be an outcome section. Again, you won't be able to deal sort of um, describe how that um, grievance will be dealt with because it is individual to every team member. However, you can detail timeframes. So how long potentially it will take for you hearing that grievance to then issue them with an outcome. So they have an idea of potentially how long it may take. And there should also be details about an appeal. So every employee who raises a grievance has the right to appeal the outcome of that grievance. So we recommend in your grievance procedure you have those details within there about an appeal as well. Now a common question we get on the helpline is um, about who should manage each of the different levels. Who should be the appeal for the grievance? Who should hear the grievance? Now we appreciate within small practices that can be really difficult because you don't have the numbers of management that can deal with those issues. So it's quite often a question we get on the helpline and we talk about who would be appropriate to do this, who would be appropriate to hear the appeal. And we sort of support you in um, managing those levels so that throughout the process you've got an appropriate person dealing with that. So if you're not sure who to put down in your grievance procedures as who will be dealing with each stage, give us a call. We can talk that through with you and we can talk through options with you as well. But it is important to remember just because you've put down your practice manager as the person to be hearing the grievance and the practice owner potentially as the person who will hear the appeal, that's not necessarily set in stone. If that's not appropriate for the circumstances, you can change that as well. So coming back to, as I mentioned earlier, with unacceptable behaviour, with grievances as well, it's also really important to deal with the matter promptly. Any delay in dealing with it is likely to make matters worse. 
So usually within a grievance procedure, there is a time frame that you have to respond to the employee after first receiving their grievance. Now that's really to um, help the team member, so make them feel engaged, make them feel valued, like you're taking their grievance seriously. By responding to them quickly, they will feel much happier about the situation. But potentially if you don't do that, if there is sort of a delay in responding to the team member, they can feel very unhappy about this. Now to give you an example of um, one of our practices that we recently supported, they um, received a grievance. Um, due to sort of things within the practice, it did take them a number of weeks to respond to that team member. Now that team member was very unhappy during those number of weeks. Um, to the extent that they were working to rule, which meant that five o'clock when their um, shift ended, they were walking out the door. And on one particular day, there was actually a patient sat in the chair coming round from sedation, but the um, nurse actually walked out of the practice because it was their time to end their shift. And that all sort of arose from them being disgruntled about the grievance not being dealt with uh, promptly. So it is really important to deal with that quickly and pick up on it to make your team members feel valued and stop any potential escalation within the practice. Now the grievance hearing then, this is an important part of um, the grievance. So anybody that raises a grievance has the right to have a grievance hearing meeting. Now this is the employee's opportunity to explain to you their grievance in more detail. So each point they've raised in their grievance, they will be able to talk through with you in more detail, potentially give you examples, give you some more information so that you can understand exactly what their grievance is about. But it is also your opportunity to ask questions about their grievance. Ask open questions to get some more information so that you fully understand the picture and can look into any matters further that you need to. But it's important to remember during that grievance hearing that both parties should be trying to seek to resolve the grievance, to try and come to a resolution. So there's a number of things that we recommend that you do during that grievance hearing. So we recommend you dedicate that time to them, potentially turn off your phone, put up a do not disturb sign on the door so that they've got that time dedicated to them. We'd also recommend you try to avoid using um, negative language. So for instance, one of our practices recently had a grievance that we helped support them with, but during that grievance hearing, they mentioned that they felt the team member was wasting their time. Now, naturally, that team member was very upset by that action and the rest of the meeting was very difficult. So we recommend trying to be positive, try to come to that resolution during the meeting and consider how they will be feeling as well. You may also need to consider where that grievance hearing is held. Particularly within small practices, rumours spread like wildfire, so it may be appropriate to potentially hold that meeting out of hours, hold the meeting off site, um, to make that employee um, feel comfortable and reassure them as well. Now, during that grievance hearing, they have the right to be accompanied and they have the right to be accompanied by a work colleague or a trade union representative. Now, with a trade union representative, if they opt to bring one of these to the meeting, we do recommend that you ask to see the trade union rep's um, credentials prior to the meeting, just to check them out. Now, with your work colleague as well, it's um, important to remember to try and make that time available for them to be able to attend the meeting. But during the grievance meeting, that um, representative can be very much involved within the meeting, so it is slightly different to a disciplinary meeting. So with the representative, they can answer questions on the team member's behalf. They can sum up the case on the team member's behalf as well, as well as sort of the usual conferring with the team member. So it's important to remember they do have the right to do that during the meeting. It can be very useful. So if you've got a particularly emotional team member, it can be very useful to be able to have someone else there to get that information from you. So it is really important. But it's also really important to remember that they have this right to be accompanied. Now, it is a right by a work colleague or a trade union representative. However, there's been lots of case law recently about um, employers in general um, unfortunately losing at a tribunal because they have refused that right to be accompanied. So if a team member requests to be accompanied by someone outside of um, work or not a trade union representative, we do recommend that you still consider their request. So don't automatically refuse it because you could potentially sort of be in that tribunal situation as other employers have recently. If particularly, for example, if it's a young team member, someone that's potentially aged 18 and they've asked for a parent to come along to the meeting, it would be good to consider that request as well due to their age. 
but also potentially as well if it's a translator we wouldn't recommend you refuse that it would be very important to have a translator there but if you're ever unsure if you're ever in the situation where you're not sure whether you should um, refuse someone's request or how to deal with it give us a call we can talk through your options with you and we can make you aware of the potential risks of refusing that request as well so investigating the grievance then. This is another really important part of the um, grievance procedure. So you need to have a thorough grievance investigation into the matter to be able to come to a resolution. Now it's important when you're doing that investigation, you investigate every single allegation that they have raised to you in detail. Now in order to be able to investigate, there may be a number of things that you have to look into. So you could have to look into um, personnel files, policies, procedures, any previous discussions you've had with a team member. You may also have to look at CCTV, social media accounts, iComply activities. There's a number of different avenues that you may have to look into. And that all really depends upon the grievance itself that's raised. But one key thing that you may need to do is investigate with other team members. So whether any witnesses to a event or something along those lines, you may need to speak to other team members. Now, because it is a formal grievance that's been raised, we do recommend that you um, hold a formal investigation with any witnesses to the events. And you document that meeting as well. So you've got that record in case you need to refer to it at a later date. Now it can be a very daunting meeting for any potential witnesses or any other employees that you need to speak to. They can be concerned that they may be in trouble or something similar. So it is important that you try to reassure them, put them at ease, just let them know that they are a witness to the incident. You just want to understand exactly what happened from their point of view to gain maximum information. Now I can't stress the importance enough of um, doing a thorough investigation into the grievance. That's really what will strengthen your case when you go back to resolving the grievance. I think moving on to resolving the grievance then, once you've done that thorough investigation, you can go back to the team member with a resolution. Now it's important to remember that unfortunately that resolution may not be exactly what the team member wants. You need to consider the practice as well and the needs of the practice. So it might not be exactly what they want. However, we do recommend that in all situations you sit down with that team member and you explain that outcome to them so they fully understand. So that could be a case of explaining to them what action you're going to take or have taken and we would recommend that you consider all avenues in this. So for instance, would it be um, appropriate to hold mediation between two parties if it's a grievance about unacceptable behaviour? But it's also important to remember data protection. So if you're explaining to a team member, <coughs> excuse me one second, sorry. Thank you. So if you're explaining to a team member that who's raised a grievance about unacceptable behaviour, that you have taken disciplinary action, it's important to remember the data protection and the confidentiality of that other team member. So we wouldn't recommend you say to them that they've been um, had a disciplinary, we've issued them with a final written warning and they'll be dismissed if they do it again. But we would recommend that you explain to them something along the lines of um, you've taken action in accordance with the disciplinary procedure. Now we can appreciate that sometimes if the team member doesn't feel they fully understand exactly the outcome, exactly what action has been taken, they don't feel like their grievance has been dealt with properly. However, by giving that full information to the team member, you risk the other team member who's potentially had that disciplinary action taken against them also raising a grievance against the practice for potential breach of data protection and breach of confidentiality. So it is important you try and balance those two options there. But once you've had that grievance, um, grievance hearing and you've had that resolution meeting, it's really important that you confirm the outcome in writing to the team member. Now this is usually a requirement within the grievance procedure that you do this within so many days, usually about seven days of the hearing. And during both the meeting and in both the letter, it's important that you inform the employee of their right to appeal. Now to give you a few examples of practices that we've recently helped and scenarios they've recently come across with a grievance, we had one practice who um, had a grievance that we were supporting them with. They really thoroughly investigated the grievance, they then had the resolution with the team member and the grievance was about unacceptable behaviour. And what they explained to that team member was 
for investigating the grievance, they did believe there was a problem with the other team member and they were concerned about how, how they were behaving and how that was making them feel and there would be further action taken against that employee. However, unfortunately, that wasn't followed up and the team member in question wasn't spoken to and their behaviour wasn't addressed. Now, what that meant was that a couple of months down the line, the team member submitted another grievance again to say that actually nothing had changed. Unfortunately, they were still behaving in that way and that was due to it not being followed up. So it is really important to follow up any actions that you have put in place to ensure that grievance is thoroughly resolved and to make sure and limit your risk of potentially having a second grievance submitted. Now the appeal then, as I mentioned earlier, all team members who raise a grievance have the right to appeal that decision if they are, aren't happy with that outcome. And we do find that um, a lot of team members, more team members appeal a grievance than they do a disciplinary outcome. So it is really important that resolution section. So with an appeal, it's important that the um, person hearing the appeal is impartial. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we appreciate that can be very difficult within small practices to be able to do that. But again, give us a talk call. We can talk you through different options about how you may be able to achieve that. Now, in particular, we did have one of our practices recently who'd um, heard the grievance. They had an appeal and um, they had arranged the appeal and everything, but the team member wasn't happy with the person that was hearing the appeal. They felt they were too involved within the practice. So what we talked to the practice owner about was how we could support both the practice and both the um, team member in achieving that impartiality. And we gave them sort of a number of options to be able to deal with that appeal and deal with it impartially, because it is important to try and ensure you can do that where possible. Now with an appeal, again it's important that you meet with that team member and talk through their appeal. So it's their opportunity again to put forward to you and explain to you why they aren't happy with the outcome and what their reasoning behind this is. So it's their opportunity to explain that to you, but also again you've got that opportunity to um, talk to them in more detail as well, ask them questions to find out a bit more information. Now, once you've had that appeal meeting, it might not always be possible, and quite often it isn't possible, to be able to deliver an outcome at the time. Quite often you will need maybe sort of 24 hours, 48 hours, to think about that outcome before you deliver your decision to them. Whether you're upholding the original decision, or potentially whether you're recommending that further or different action is taken. But once you've had that meeting, there is um, sort of usually a requirement within procedures to um, respond to that team member in writing, usually a deadline again, so again around about seven days. So it's important that you do follow the outcome of the appeal up in writing to them and you clarify in that letter that there is no further right of appeal. So whether that team member is then happy with the response, is happy with the action that's taken, unfortunately internally there is no further right of appeal, so both parties need to find a way to move forward together and work together professionally. So records then, I've talked a lot about the importance of making notes during the meetings, documenting the meetings. It is really important to hold those records on file. So keep them within the team member's personnel file. So that could be, for instance, copies of the original grievance itself, copies of documents and notes made during all meetings. So both the grievance hearing and any investigation meetings, including any investigation meetings held with um, other team members. The outcome letter and any appeal details as well. Keep those documents on file, you may need them at a later date. And it's also important to remember that with GDPR that you hold those records confidentially and securely. Now the reason records are so important is because unfortunately if you do end up in the scenario that you're in a tribunal, the tribunal will not consider whether you've been genuine, the employee's been genuine, they will look at your records, they will look at whether you have followed the right process, so it's really important to keep that evidence and documentation. So let's talk about the consequences then, the consequences of getting it wrong. Now one of the key ones has got to be compensation. So potentially, um, if you don't follow your grievance procedure, you don't follow the ACAS procedure, that employee feels disgruntled, they could potentially take you to a tribunal. Now with a tribunal, 
for purely for the failure to follow either the ACAS code of practice or your own grievance procedure, there is an automatic 25% increase to any tribunal fee awarded to an employee. So that's potentially a large sum of money just for failure to follow the correct process. So it is really important that you make sure you are following the processes and you seek advice if you're not sure to avoid becoming almost one of those statistics. But also, should the employee perhaps not go to a tribunal, they do remain within the workplace. They can feel very disgruntled, very unhappy. They may have sort of low engagement, low morale. So it's managing that impact on the workplace following the grievance being submitted as well. So as we mentioned, with tribunals, it's really important that you've got a number of documentation in place. So we have a number of templates, a number of policies on iComply that you can potentially use. So there's the grievance procedure. We have a template grievance procedure on there that you can use as well. And there's a number of documents that you can use to record the notes of the meetings. Now, one key policy to point out is right at the bottom, the anti-bullying and harassment policy. Now, with everything that's been in the news recently, we are currently updating that policy. So for everyone that's an iComply member, you should shortly receive notification when that new version is released. And when it is released, we do recommend that you have a look through that policy, read it, but also issue it to your team members for them to read, sign and return to you as well to keep within their personnel files. So let's just touch upon some of your recommended actions for next week to avoid those potential consequences that we discussed earlier. So one of the key ones we recommend is to review your grievance procedure. Check you've got a grievance procedure in place. Check that it's robust. Our grievance procedure on iComply is a really good starting point. But we also recommend that you review our guidance on grievance and disciplinary procedures on iComply. So follow in today's webinar, that will give you a bit more information as well. You may also find it useful to review the ACAS Code of Conduct as well. So I'm just going to briefly recap over what we have covered today. So we've talked about what unacceptable behaviour is and how to manage unacceptable behaviour. We've also talked about how unacceptable behaviour links to grievances what grievances are and how to deal with them in line with legislation and we've also touched upon why it's important to always seek advice and those potential consequences that may happen if you don't follow the correct procedure. Now due to those potential consequences that are um, sort of potentially there that's why we've um, set up the Code Total HR and Employment Law Service to be able to support you. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we really focus on is prevention, prevention rather than cure. So to be able to do that, we have a full HR documentation and contract set up for your practices. So we create bespoke contracts and um, your handbook and policies for your practice. And that covers sort of both, um, the contracts cover both your self-employed and employed team members as well. And by having that robust documentation in place that helps sort of prevent any issues in the future but we also review those documents on an annual basis so to check they are still up to date and if there have been any legislation changes we update them in line with those as well there is also a web application available so that helps you to manage your staff holidays your staff sickness and you can also use it to store documents on as well now, one of the really popular features of the Total HR package is um, the unlimited access to a HR advisor. So there is no limit on the number of times that you can call us for advice. But the, probably the most popular feature that our Total members enjoy is the bespoke letters. So we will help you write bespoke letters. So in terms of your grievance letters, we can write those for you. We'll support you with that. It's a really popular function of the Total service. There's also the um, option for additional insurance as well. So if you are interested, please give our professional services team a call and they can offer you a bespoke rotation. So just to make you aware then of some upcoming events that we've got, our next webinar in our series of 10 is on Thursday the 11th of October and that will be on Recruitment Essentials with my colleague Sophie Eggleton. We also have a HR and Employment Law Seminar coming up in London on the 9th of November which we're all very excited about. And there is CPD available for that day as well. We also have a compliance update day in um, 23rd of November, also in London. And again, there's CPD available for that day. So if you're interested in these events, want to book or want a bit more information, just follow the link on your screen now. 
but also to make you aware, you can view our previous um, webinars. So if you're unable to sort of attend the last one, they are all available on our website as well if you do want to have a look at them. And again, the link is on your screen now.